If you would grab a Bible, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6 is where we'll begin our time of study this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Good to see you. I have been uh, not sitting in front of you for the last couple of weeks because I've been in other places, and uh, I appreciate all of your thoughts and concern in checking on me and thinking about me. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Brother Lee coming and, and preaching in my place and Zach getting his uh, first rattle out of the bag. His first Sunday here, he has to be up here, and I appreciate him uh, filling in. heard a lot of good things about the work that he did last week. Uh, but it's good to be back with you again and to be uh, right here, maybe not up here, but at least here on the stool where I've been for the last couple of months here. Well, it's our VBS week, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, it is our VBS, and as usual, we've had a lot of people who have worked hard to decorate the building and to work on writing class material to try to make the Bible come alive for our kids. And things are a little different this year uh, for a couple of reasons. Ordinarily, we have done VBS, at least since I've been here, in the mornings. And uh, this year, we're doing it in the evenings, tonight, and Monday night and Tuesday night. And then also, ordinarily, we have done the part of our VBS where we have skits and try to act out the Bible stories. We've done that in the back classroom. Uh, but for a couple of reasons, uh, one being that a lot of people wanted to see uh, the skits and we couldn't fit everybody back in that back classroom. And the other being because we're at night, we're expecting more people. Uh, we've decided to do it in the auditorium this year. So that's the reason all of this is up, to be prepared for tonight. The, the theme this year is Nehemiah, and so what you're looking at is the throne room where Nehemiah uh, asks to be able to go and help rebuild the walls, and then also, I hope I'm not giving away the plot, uh, but also the walls that are torn down. And the story of Nehemiah is a great story of faith in God and the things God can do when people have a mind to work, have the courage and faith to work for God. I want to remind you that no matter where it is, whether it's back there or in here, our goal in the VBS is to teach the Bible. That's the goal. We want to, our young people in particular to know more about God and the way God's revealed himself in the Bible. And I want to remind you that this is just a building and that there is no one room that's holier than another room. This room is not different from the back classroom or any other room here. All of these rooms are rooms that we have built as we pooled our resources as a congregation so that we could teach the Bible. And so that's what we're trying to do. I know that this might be a distraction this morning from what we're doing in our worship, but I want to remind you it's part of our efforts to teach and that our children are a part of this congregation too. We want to help them to make the Bible come alive. So having said all of that, certainly we can still worship God with the appropriate reverence that he is due regardless of what else is going on with our formatting and where we are. I want to share a couple of things with you about the schedule tonight, just so that you know it's a little different from our typical Sunday night schedule, and I wanted to show you that. If I turn this on, it would help. There we are. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're going to meet from 5 to about 6.30, a little longer service tonight. For the first 10 minutes, we're going to be here in the auditorium singing the VBS songs, and getting ready for the skit, we're going to have the skit from 5.10 to 5.25 here. And then from 5.25 to 6.10, we're going to divide into our classes. Uh, Brother Richard is going to be teaching out here an adult class on the same material on Nehemiah. Uh, and uh, that'll be from 5.25 to 6.10, the typical 45 minutes that we have for classes. And then we're going to meet back in here. And tonight, we're going to have just our typical service after a class on Sunday night, where we have a song or two and the Lord's Supper. There'll be an invitation and closing song. We'll have announcements and prayer. Then uh, we'll break at about 6.30. Uh, and remember that we have planned uh, our potluck over at the Easter Seals building uh, for this evening after the, the close of that service. So that's the schedule for tonight. If you come tonight, things are a little different. That's what's going on. I just wanted to get everybody on the same page. All right. So uh, excited about that and looking forward to the week. I hope you'll be in prayer and I hope that you'll plan on being here. Uh, even if you don't have kids or grandkids that are able to come, uh, we're having adult classes. We've made special provision for that. We have classes for the high school and junior high as well. Uh, everybody can come and can learn about the story of Nehemiah, and we can grow together as a church. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 9 says, 
But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Paul's trying to convince Timothy about something that has some really horrible consequences. You can see it in the words that he uses about temptation and ruin and destruction and piercing themselves through with many sorrows. He is saying that the love of money has an ugly end, and he wants him to know that so that he doesn't pursue that and follow it to that end. One of the most important things that the Bible teaches us is that in life, things are not always as they appear. That things may appear a certain way, and the reality is far different, and very often, far worse. And so what I want to do in our time this morning is I want to look at some of the ways the Bible illustrates how sin is not what it appears to be, and to use some of the images that the Bible uses to describe sin. The reason I want to do that, please hear me before I put on the board what we're going to talk about, the reason why I want to do that is because sometimes we struggle with just what sin is. And sometimes we struggle with why sin is such a big deal. Why it's a big deal to God and why it's a big deal to us. What's the big deal about sin? And sometimes we struggle with getting too close to the line of sin. Where we wonder, where exactly did God draw the line? Is, is this okay or is this okay? Can I do this? Or am I going to go to hell if I do this? Am I going to lose my salvation if I do this? And we, we struggle with some of that. And I believe that the images that the Bible uses to describe sin are going to help us. And along the way, we're going to think a little bit about why we sin. So that with the help of God, we can learn to move past sin in our own lives. So what we're going to talk about this morning is mousetrap spirals and chains different images that the Bible uses to describe sin. First, I want to talk about mousetraps. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9, the text says, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 9, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare. That word snare is the Greek word for mousetrap. It's also a word that's used to talk about trapping game or trapping birds. The idea is that the love of money entraps. That is, it gets us in a way that we weren't expecting because it's offering something that's different from what it actually delivers. It is not what it appears to be. We feel that we're getting one thing. In this case, the love of money, we think we're pursuing money and the pleasure that money's going to provide and the security that money's going to provide and the freedom money is going to provide. But instead, we pierce ourselves through with many sorrows. We are trapped by it, just like a mouse trap. This image of, of a snare is used quite often in Scripture. I want you to turn with me to chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy, just over a couple of pages. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2, 24, it says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God perhaps may grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So Timothy, as you deal with people outside, he says you deal with them with humility, with kindness. You be gentle because you understand who they are. They are people who have been ensnared and captured by the devil. He says specifically in verse 26 that they may escape from the snare of the devil. The snare of the devil is a, a term that's also used in the elder qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 to talk about a man who was could be a novice and could fall into the snare of the devil. And that, that danger implies that Satan has laid out a trap for us and that he is trying to offer us something that is not what it appears to be so that he can capture us. And so you see here in verse 26 the idea both of the snare of the devil and that we can be captured by him to do his will. So, when you understand that there are mouse traps, the question is, how do you respond to mouse traps? I think that's pretty simple. When we see physical traps, we don't try to get really close to them. I think in particular of the, the really strong traps, you got a bear trap, you got something that could really hurt you, you're not going to get really close. 
You're not going to see what you can do to, to, well, what would happen if I did this? Okay, this is something that you learn. Let's just stay away from that. There is a danger there. And so the Bible uses an image so that we can see it and know that we want to stay away. Look with me in Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7. God is telling us these things because he expects us to have our behavior affected by the knowledge that this is a trap. Proverbs 7 and verse 21. So Proverbs 7 describes the immoral woman, the one who would appeal to the young man and lead him astray. And listen to how he describes the sort of the, the application point of his little illustration. Proverbs 7 and verse 21, With much seductive speech she persuades him. With her smooth talk she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces his liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let your heart not turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim she has laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Don't even, he says, don't even go near her door. It's a trap. Watch out. And he uses these images of, of animals that don't realize they're about to be caught, like an ox going to the slaughter. It's about to be his end, but he doesn't realize it. As a bird flies into a trap. He says, that's what you're like. When you go into sin, you don't even see the trap that you're marching into. So, we warn about drugs, or we warn about promiscuity, or we warn about alcohol, or we warn about corrupt languages. And, and what we do when we, when we do that, the reason we warn is because those are things that will ensnare us. They will trap us. And, and it's not a simple relationship where I do what I want and then I go about my life. It is something that will capture us. It is something that's not what it appears. I want to show you this too. In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 25, he says, The carved images of their gods you shall burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them or take it for yourselves, lest you be ensnared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. So notice that the idea of being ensnared by idolatry, in particular by the beauty of the idols and the silver and the gold on the idols. Now, God had already said, don't worship me with idols. But here, it's not about that. It's about, well, what do you do with the physical idol? And he says, you burn it with fire. Don't let it linger so that if you wanted, you might worship it. Or you might melt it down and get that gold and that, that um, silver. He says, you might be ensnared by it. If you know it's a trap, you react a certain way. So, when you think about a mouse trap, you can see why sin is such a big deal to God and should be a big deal to us, right? It's not what it appears to be, and it will hurt. You see why we should stay away from sin. We would never say, why should I stay away from mouse traps? What's the big deal? It's obvious, right? That's what sin is. In fact, why would we even try to get close to it? But why would we be interested in the trap at all? What draws us toward the mousetrap of sin? We're going to talk about that more. Just, just leave that thought. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Why would we do this in the first place? If we know it's a trap, why would we ever sin? Let's talk about the second image. Let's talk about the idea of a spiral. Now, let me be clear, the word spiral is not used as I am ex explaining it in Scripture, but I wanted a picture that describes this aspect of sin that is very clearly present in the Bible. That is, that sin grows, and that it grows progressively downward. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. trying to say with this that sin is not a static force. That sin is dynamic. It is growing. It infests. It corrupts. It spreads. Romans chapter 1, I want to begin in verse 21. Romans 1 and verse 21, where he is describing, I believe here, the, the Gentiles and their descent into really awful moral behavior. In Romans 1 and verse 21, he says, For although they knew God... 
They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. What I want you to see is in this passage, things get worse and worse and worse. If we were to describe it, we would describe it as a downward spiral. And it begins with things that might seem innocent. It begins back in verse 21 with, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. And we would say, well, not being thankful, that's, that's not good. That's not polite. But we wouldn't say that's a problem. Not like it becomes a problem, and it gets worse and worse. And so it leads them to exchange the image of the, the true God for the image, the creator for the creature. So they begin to worship idols. It leads to them into all kinds of aberrant sexual behavior, where they exchange what's natural for what's unnatural. It leads them to what Paul calls a debased mind, beginning in verse 28, where they begin to do all kinds of things, he says, that ought not to be done. And you wonder, well, how do people get to this point? And sometimes we ask that question. Maybe we ask it about criminals who do really awful things. And we ask, well, how do they get to this point? Or, or we ask about somebody who is in some kind of major big scandal that everyone that becomes public and everyone shakes their head in shame. How do they get to this point? And the answer is, this is what sin does. It starts with something small and it grows and it infests and it corrupts and it will lead us as far as we can go. That's what sin is. So... That's what happens with addictions. Addictions worsen. And so we have what we call gateway drugs that lead to other drugs, worse drugs, harder drugs. Or we have the lines of physical intimacy. They're crossed and then the line goes further back and further back and further back. That's what sin does. Or we have anger, where anger escalates and escalates and escalates. Very rarely does it get better and better and better. That's not what sin does. These things don't just resolve themselves. Sin never just resolves itself. That's not its nature. Let's look at a couple other instances of this. Let's look in 2 Samuel chapter 11, back in the Old Testament. Talk a little bit about David in 2 Samuel 11. <clears throat> Second Samuel 11, we're going to read beginning in verse 1. It says, Second Samuel 11 and verse 1, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. as She had been purifying herself from her uncleanness, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So, he calls Uriah back from the battle when he discovers that his wife is pregnant. And in verse 13, it says, David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. And in the morning... David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. Verse 26. 
When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when that morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Did you see what happened in the chapter? In fact, it's very interesting that David, in just this one chapter, goes from someone so noble and so heroic to someone so despicable so quickly. But it begins with David watching this woman bathing. And then that leads to him calling for and committing adultery with her. And that leads for him, leads to him calling Uriah back from the battle. And that leads to him getting Uriah drunk to try to cover up what he's done. And that leads to him having Uriah killed. So, this is what sin does. Sin leads to more sin. And when we begin down the path of sin, we're not surprised when we end up where David ended up. That's just the nature of sin. It doesn't naturally stop. Do you want a, a, an image? How about 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17? where it's talking about evil speaking, in particular false teaching, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene, like a cancer. It just keeps growing and consuming. That's sin. That's what it does. It leads to more and more ungodliness. Evil men and imposters will grow on getting worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Go with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. When James talks about sin, this is the way he talks about it. He talks about sin as having a natural endpoint, but not in and of itself and not in a way that's good. <clears throat> James chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. James 1 and verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But, James 1, 14, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Sin grows. That's what he says in verse 15. It grows up, and it continues to progress until it is fully grown. And then it brings forth death. That's the danger. The danger is that sin grows like a spiral. Once we enter it, we go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. And it won't just end. That's not what sin does. Now that image helps me. Because it shows me why sin is such a big deal. It shows me why I must have zero tolerance for sin. Because that's what sin does. It is not a static force. I do it sometimes and I don't do it other times. Sin is something that once I start down the spiral, I get further and further down. All right, let's talk about the third image. Let's talk about the question, the idea of chains. Let's go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. <clears throat> we read this in our reading. John chapter 8 and verse 31 in our uh, gospel reading. I believe it was this week, right? Okay. Uh, I, I'm reading in like three different places for the readings right now, but I think it was John 8 that we read in our, uh, our Year with Jesus readings. John 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Notice Jesus' words. Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. That's why I put the word chains on the board. I want us to think about the idea that sin makes slaves. That's what sin does. Sin makes slaves. Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. It clamps chains on us. It becomes our master. It dictates our behavior. When we choose to sin, we form a relationship with sin and not one that's flattering to us. We form the relationship with sin that it calls the shots and I must follow it. That's what sin does. That's what Jesus says about sin. 
in Titus chapter 3, Paul talks about this. Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> Titus 3 and verse 3. We're going to read Paul's words here. He says, Titus 3, 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. So, this is the former life Paul is describing before we were set free by Jesus. And he says specifically there that we were slaves to various passions and pleasures. We had to do what our passions and pleasures told us to do. We had no choice. We were the victims of our passions and pleasures. They were calling the shots. We were in chains. And sin consumes us as our master. It is what we live for. Sin becomes what makes life exciting when it is our master. Even, even when we know the guilt that comes after the sin, sin becomes what makes life exciting. And so it seems as though life is, is dull and pointless without it because it is in charge. We keep coming back to it. And it poisons our sense of who we are, our pride in ourselves, our sense of self-esteem. We know how wrong we are, but we cannot change that fate. We are slaves. And that is a desperate, awful situation. Look with me at one last passage here in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, where Paul describes this. When some people have asked the question, some Christians have asked the question, can we just keep sinning after we've been set free? And Paul says, you've got to understand that what sin does is make slaves. And if you understand that, you're not going to want to keep sinning. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 15. Romans 6 and verse 15. What then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart through the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. Sin is a slave maker. Look again at verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness. You're somebody's slave, but when you commit sin, you're a slave of sin. Jesus has already told us this. I want to show you a couple of places in the, in the Bible where this image is used also. Uh, when it talks about Ahab, it says there was no one who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel and his wife, his wife incited. The idea of selling himself to do evil means he is, he is all out, all in. I guess those mean the same thing, don't they? All out and all in to commit evil. I am fully committed to sinning. He sold himself. When, when Peter confronts Simon the sorcerer, he says, I see that you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You, you've become a slave again, Simon. Second Peter 2 and verse 19, they promised them, this is talking about some false teachers, they promised them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. So, all the images we associate with slavery, the loss of our personal freedom, the inability to escape service, the need for some kind of external help to set us free, God says associate that with sin. Sin brings the chains. Sin enslaves. And that helps us. Because it helps us see why sin is such a big deal, right? Sin makes slaves. And so we want to stay away from it. It explains to us how sin can have such a grip on us that we find ourselves coming back to it even though we hate it. Because sin's really in charge. We are enslaved to it. Sin, in other words, is not what it seems. We think we're getting one thing. When in fact we get another. Mouse traps, spirals, and chains all show us that sin is not what it appears to be. And the devil is using it to trap us and to take us farther from God, to enslave us. So please hear me. 
When God says something is wrong, that's not arbitrary. That God is just going through life and he decides, you know, I think that should be wrong and that should be wrong and I don't really like that or that. God is trying to warn us about things that are ultimately to our bad. He wants what's best for us. One person has said that sin will take us further than we wanted to go, keep us longer than we wanted to stay, and cost us more than we wanted to pay. By the way, Zach, that'll preach. So, I've hinted as we've gone along about the deeper question of why we sin. I mean, if we know this about sin, then why do we ever sin? What's the bait in the mousetrap? Sin is a perversion of things that are good. Things that God has placed in us, desires that we naturally have for good things God's made that are perverted to entrap us. Sometimes that's about encouraging us to pursue good things in evil ways or to pursue perversions of the real thing. So, for example, we exchange what we're really seeking like true intimacy with another person. And we exchange it for the perversion, promiscuous sex, or pornography. Or we exchange real self-worth for egotism and pride. Or we exchange real religion for idolatry where we want to serve something, but we'd really prefer to serve something that's just like what we want. Or we exchange real value, that I matter and I mean something, and exchange that for materialism, where I matter because I have stuff. Or we exchange real connection with others for manipulation, for false respect. If I can get you to do what I like, then I know I'll have some value. We exchange real work and the pride and respect it brings for shortcuts. We exchange real conversation for gossip or criticism or slander. We exchange real respect from others, the desire that we have within us, for arrogance or for the flattery of others. We exchange real inner peace that we're all seeking for attention to our physical bodies. We exchange God's love and acceptance that we all want and need for the love and acceptance of other people. We sin because we want those things so deeply. We were made for them. But we're unwilling to do the hard work that is required of seeking them God's way. We all want the warmth and the joy that comes from a deep, fulfilling relationship, but sometimes relationships are hard, and it's easier to exchange it for the fake. Just seek out pornography. We all want God's acceptance and peace, but sometimes it's hard to work our way through what God really wants. And so, it's easier to fashion God into somebody who already approves of what I do. So while on one level, I preach this sermon because I want to change our attitude towards sin, and I want us to see sin as it really is. On another level, I want us to ask the questions of ourselves. Why do I sin? What is it I'm seeking when I do wrong? And how can I find it in the right way? And when we're honest with ourselves, I'm convinced that we'll find we're doing one of those exchanges where we exchange what's true and good for the perversion. Here's the good news. The good news is the real thing is available. The things that we're seeking, we can find in God. 
the love and acceptance that we're seeking, the value, the identity that we're all looking for, the pleasure that comes from doing things that are truly worthwhile and valuable, we find that only in Christ. So we don't have to go looking at all the fake. If we will trust Him and follow His will for us, we find what we're really seeking. Would you pray with me about that? Our God, we are so thankful to you because we've been able to gather together today to open your word together and to think about how you've tried to reach out to us, how you've revealed your mind to us so that we know you, so that we know the world, so that we know ourselves. Father, we're thankful for this knowledge, although it, it creates a responsibility for us. Father, we come to you as, as creatures who are sinful. All of us have experience in, in being enslaved by sin. Father, we know what sin does to us. And yet, Father, we, we still struggle with it. And we pray that as we think about these things and as we, we try earnestly to pursue you, that you'll help us to have insight into why sin is such a problem and into why we choose to sin. Father, as we do this self-examination, as we think about our lives and our choices, we pray that you'll help us have that insight. And Father, we pray that you'll give us the courage and the endurance to seek your way. Give us a heart, Father, to trust that your way is always best. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There might be someone here this morning who is enslaved by sin. And you know what I've been talking about because you are living it. And you know that feeling that you are not in control. And you need to be set free. As Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. And the promise of the gospel is that when we come in obedient faith to Jesus, we can have our sins washed away. And we become slaves of righteousness, slaves of God. We become His servants. And now we have a life that we can be proud of and we can be free. So if you're here this morning and you're ready to make that step, you want to come to us, come to us because as we are here, we're trying to help you connect to God. If you want to come forward and turn away from your sin, confess your faith in Jesus as the Messiah, we can help you to be baptized into Christ, have those sins washed away. Or if there's a need that you have that we can help you with to pray with you, to do anything we can to help you to be right with God. We ask you to come to the front right now as we stand and sing to encourage.